Today we're looking at uh, the last part of Matthew 13 and the parables of Jesus. And he asks an interesting question. He asks, do you understand? Do you understand? Now he has talked about all these things in the parables, hasn't he? And you may be wise to this week to go back and just read through them again. But the question is, do you understand all of these things? That's a simple question, but sometimes it can be complex too. It should be a simple one, right? I mean, you, if, if you remember as you were raising kids and you would say, hey, do you understand? That could be a complicated moment. They may not completely understand. Sometimes speakers may ask of the audience, hey, do you understand? Is that clear? Do you, do you get it? Is it do, you, do you understand? And that can be a complicated moment. And so Jesus is asking them, do you understand? And really, when you look at that, there's a couple of different things we need to think about when he's asking, do you understand? Because if the Word of God, and it is, it's for us, not just for them, it's for us, Jesus is then asking us, we've heard all these parables, we've heard all about the kingdom of heaven in this chapter, do you understand? In other words, one, do you comprehend the topic? And that's one way you can look at understanding, is a, is a basic comprehension. Do you, do you get it? Do you understand the topic? And so, as we uh, have in, in a few moments this final small parable uh, that Jesus talks about, the storehouse and the landowner, we need to be asking ourselves, do I understand what it is that Jesus is trying to tell me? Do I understand and comprehend the topic? Uh, another uh, way that we can interpret do you understand is do you have a realization of the moment? Do you have a realization of the moment? Jesus was just about, uh, not long after this Matthew 13, He's not long uh, for leaving, and He is trying to get His disciples more and more prepared for what's coming and for what their responsibilities are going to be. Do you realize what's going on in the moment? The disciples sometimes had conflict with that and sometimes they, they didn't always get it. I mean, this is why Jesus later will say, you know, that uh, I'm, I'm going to Jerusalem and Thomas is like, okay, let's go die with him. You know, he's going to say, well, I've, I'm going to be taken by the Pharisees, and Peter steps in, no, you can't do that, that's not the way this is supposed to be, I'll die with you, you know, and Jesus is like, okay, settle down, Peter, because you're going to deny me before you'll die with me. And so it's complicated sometimes, do you realize, do you get the moment, do you get what's happening here? Sometimes when we ask people, do you understand? It's a, do you understand the times? Do you understand the moments? Do you understand what's happening here right now? Not just a comprehension uh, of a topic, but in a realization of what's going on in the, in the moment. And, and a third way is the acceptance to carry on what's happening. Do, are you ready to, to carry on? Do, do you understand what I'm asking? You know, sometimes we, we might ask things in a little bit of a cryptic way, right? And, and we, we're like, hey, do, do you understand? Maybe because not everybody else in the room, do, you, do they need to understand? It's, do you understand? And then typically in a movie setting or a TV setting, somebody typically will walk out of the room and go handle some business. Do you understand? Are you ready to accept the responsibility of what Jesus is asking. Because if you read through all of the kingdom of heaven passages, and as he concludes with this next one, we have to be asking ourselves these things. Do I understand? Do I comprehend what he wants to tell me? Do I realize what's going on in the moment? And am I ready to accept the responsibility that he's going to ask of me? Because if all we do is fill ourselves with teaching, but never contribute back to the next generation, we've utterly lost. I mean, we see this all throughout Scripture. Jesus is going to be telling His disciples the same thing as time goes on before He exits. He's like, look, 
you, you know all this, you understand. Right? Do you understand that I'm asking you to carry on what I'm doing? And later in, in Matthew, he'll, and, and we'll talk about it again in a moment, later in Matthew, Jesus is saying, okay, I'm passing on all of my authority now to you. When the Spirit comes, you are to go and make disciples, baptize, and teach them. You are to teach them what? All the things that I've taught you. To not just take what I've given you, but to pass it on along and to give that away. So I invite you to turn back with me to Matthew chapter 13 as we look at verse 52. We've addressed verse 51. Now let's look at verse 52. And he says, I'll read it and then we're going to go back through and talk about it. Therefore, he said to them, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of the storeroom treasures new and old. Now, I wonder, did you catch the difference with this one? Did you catch the difference with this one? Because he says something is like something else, but... Throughout Matthew 13, what has he said? The kingdom of heaven is like. That's what he's been saying. That's not what he says this time. He says, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like. And so he's personalizing this much more than the others. He's been trying to expand our understanding and our minds about the kingdom of heaven and all of the realities and responsibilities of the kingdom of heaven. And now he's making it personal. And he says, okay, do you understand what I've been saying? Why? Because every scribe, which is what some of your translations may say, every student of the scripture or every scribe, Matthew in chapter 2 and verse 4, he begins and talks about scribes there the first time. And he talks about them being scholars and teachers of the scripture. And this is what he's talking about. When he is talking about a scribe or a student of the scripture, he's talking about those individuals that are scholars and teachers of the scriptures. But watch this. In Matthew 28 and verse 19, he says that we as followers and disciples are to be doing what? Teaching the scriptures. We sometimes relegate that to one or two or a handful of folks. We think, well, the preacher needs to do it. The, and the deacons say, well, the Bible says we're supposed to be prepared to do it. And Sunday school teachers say, well, I know I'm supposed to do it. But oftentimes the rest of us think, well, that's not for me to do. That's not what the Great Commission says. The Great Commission doesn't say those with the gift or position are the ones who are supposed to be teaching. He says, no, all of us are to be out making disciples, to baptize and to teach. So not only is it all of our responsibilities for evangelism, not just, not just those with the gift of it, but also it's all of our responsibilities to be scholars and teachers of the scriptures not just a handful of folks that have the title, gift, or position for it. We are all called to be scholars and teachers of the Scripture. We're all supposed to be a part of that. That's the model of discipleship. It's not for a few to be disciplers. It's for all those who have decided by faith to be a follower of Jesus. You have been called then to be a disciple maker. Do you understand? We are all called to be a part of that. We are all called then to be scholars and teachers. Now the word scholar there scares a bunch of us. Well, I don't have that level of education. Neither did Peter. Peter was a fisherman. Peter was on the low end of the totem pole of the socioeconomic levels. He didn't have much. He wasn't much. But in the hands of God, little can be made into much. So it is with our life. You say, well, I don't have the education. I don't have the training. I don't have the experience. 
It doesn't negate the reality that we are called to have a responsibility to be scholars and teachers of the Word of God. We are to be learning the Word of God and we are to be teaching the Word of God. This is what we are called to do. Going back to the words of Jesus, do you understand? So what does this mean? First of all, it means that we are to know the Bible. We are to know the Bible. We need to dive in and dig in, and we are to know the Scriptures. We need to know them. Well, I, I, you know, I, I just can't retain what I used to retain. I'm not asking you for memorization. I'm asking you, know the Scriptures. Come on. There's a lot of times, myself included... I can recall a scripture in the Bible. I don't remember its address, clearly. Anybody else with me on that matter? I don't always remember the address. Now, I think it would be helpful to remember the address, but we don't always remember the address. Here's the sticking point. Just make sure what you quote is actually in there. <laughs> Amen. An apple a day keeps the doctor away does not have an address in Scripture. It's not in there. And we need to know that. There's other things that we might quote. And the hazard that we need to have is that we don't misquote it. If you want to know all of the misquoted Scriptures, fancy yourself to go to Facebook and you'll find quite a few things that are misquoted and abused uh, and not the reality of what Scripture says. Let me give you the famous one. God will not put more on me than I can handle. That's not in Scripture. What Scripture actually says, and it's a letter of Paul to the Corinthian church, what he actually says is God will not put you in a position where sin's your only option. Except he always provides a way out. You're going to be, Paul will say in the same letter, there's more on me than I can handle. Therefore, I must trust God more. We see another time where Paul prays and he says, Look, I've got this thorn in the flesh. And oh my goodness, the articles that are out there about what that is. Not the important part. He said, I prayed to the Lord three times. Lord, take it away. And God said, What? My grace is sufficient in your Weakness. I dare say that Paul probably in either the second or the third one said, this is more than I can handle. To which God said, my grace is sufficient in your weakness. It's not that God won't allow us to take on and have more than we can handle. Let me let you in on a secret. A lot of times when we get in that mess, it's because of our own choices. God didn't do it. God had a better plan. But we rebelled. We had a better plan. How's that plan working out for you? Do you understand? We must know the Bible. You may not know all the, the addresses, but know the Bible. How, how do you do that? We well, have to be committed to it. And that takes reading. I know, the dreaded reading. It takes reading. you got to be in it if you want to know it. If I can ask you about statistics of a baseball game or a football game or a soccer game, and you can relay those statistics to me in detail from a World Series or a Super Bowl event that happened 35 years ago, but you don't know things about the Bible, we have to have a conversation. Is there anything wrong with knowing all the statistics of that world? No. But know your Bible. Be committed to the Bible. Luther had a way of saying sola scriptura. Scripture alone. That's our guide. God has granted us this fabulous book for us to know and understand. Because why? We're called to teach this. We're called 
to teach it to our spouses. We're called to teach it to our children. We're called to teach it to our grandchildren. We're called to teach it to our co-workers and our, our peer group. We're called to teach it to the next generation. We're called to teach it not by title, position, or gift, but because I have simply been forgiven of my sin by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit is now upon you that is now calling us to be scholars and teachers of the Scriptures. We must be committed to the Scriptures. This is why we don't preach pop psychology. We preach the Scriptures. This is why we don't preach the comic books. We preach the Scriptures. This is why we don't use other things. We preach the Scriptures. I think sometimes it's easy for us to get involved in all of the devotional books but not read the Scriptures. It's easy for us to hear other people's opinions without reading the Scriptures. We need to read the scriptures. We must be committed to the Bible. It is the way God has chosen for us to understand him, to understand ourselves, and to know how we are to move forward. It's the scriptures. This is what he has given. This is what he's given to us. Which results in a life based on the Bible. Results in a life based on, if I know it and I'm committed to it, my life is going to reflect that. Is my life, is your life based on the Bible? I fear that oftentimes, in theory, our life is based on the Bible. We all would certainly say my eternal life is based on the Bible. But is your today life based on the Bible? I fear that oftentimes, even the greatest of disciples of Christ are basing their life decisions on economics, on family traditions, on family pressures, on socioeconomic things, on corporate ladders, on all kinds of cultural manifestations, but we are not actually basing our life decisions on the Word of God. And this is why the church in America is weak today. This is why so often churches in America don't have or experience the Spirit of God because we ran Him out years ago by our own desires and our own preferences and our own idolatries. The church in America will only be strong when we know, committed, and live according to the Word of God. Amen. And anything less is not what God has desired for us because it's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, look, that every teacher of the law or student of the scripture who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like an owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom treasures new and old. We need both new and old. Now, there's several things that we can look at here with new and old. We, we, need to, we can look at and go, you know what? It's not just the New Testament. It's the Old Testament, too. We, we can't forsake the Old Testament. We need to understand the New Testament because of the Old Testament. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. You don't fully appreciate what Jesus did if you don't understand what happened in the Old Testament. We can't fully appreciate where we are without the Old Testament. And in this time of year, in this time of season where we are welcoming in the Christ child, all those prophecies are Old Testament. They're all Old Testament. The Pharisees missed it. The scribes missed it. But you know what I find interesting? Sometimes we do too. And we get stuck in the New Testament. And we don't understand the Old Testament. Yes, the Old Testament has some dry parts. Let's just all own it and realize it and accept it. It's got some dry parts. It's got some complicated parts. It's got some confusing parts. There are those in our culture today that would say to us that I love the God of the New Testament, but I don't love the God of the Old. You can't love one and not love the other. If you love one but not the other, you don't love Yahweh. You don't love Jehovah God. You don't love the God, the creator, sustainer, and giver of Jesus Christ. You don't love God. You love a God of your own making, which is called idolatry, which you find in the Old Testament a lot. 
I've been reading through uh, Kings and Chronicles in my quiet time this last few days and, and coming up on, on a few weeks as, we walk, as I walk through that. And reading through that, it's, it's fascinating how they present these kings. So-and-so, the son of so-and-so, in the year of so-and-so, came to the throne. But he did not follow in the steps of the father David. He did not follow the ways of God. But he followed other ways. He, or, or it says, and they try to make it sound nice, right? They said, well, he, they, 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 they followed the ways of God, but they didn't put away the high places of Baal or Asherah. You know, that's almost like 2022 tolerance talk in our culture today, isn't it? Well, you know, it, what's good for you, that's good for you. It's not good for me. But So I'm going to do my thing and you do your thing. Your thing may be sending you to an eternal hell. We have the message of the gospel. We've got to know it, be committed to it, have a life based upon it so we can speak to it. Because if our life, if our life decisions, if our daily routines are not founded in Scripture, this world will call you on. And we'll say, but you don't live it, why should I? And we usually try to come back with this trite statement. Well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's true. Don't let it be the excuse for why you're not letting your decisions be based upon the word of God. Don't let that be the excuse. It's a reality. Don't make it the excuse. So bring out what's old and new. Bring, bring it out. Bring, bring out the old, bring out the new. He said, look, when he's talking about teachers and being teachers and teaching these others, it's like this guy who brings out the old stuff, brings out the new stuff. You know, Jesus himself said in, in, in Matthew 5, he said, I didn't come to destroy and to get rid of all the law. I came to fulfill them. Jesus didn't devalue the old. We need both. We need both of them. We need the old, we need the new. We need to understand that both are important. That we should not despise one or the other, but understand how they work together, how they function together to make a whole message of God to us. So that we can continue to live according to the scriptures as it has been intended to. We need to bring out of his storeroom treasures new and old. This is the question of the day. One, do you understand that you are a scholar and teacher of the scripture? Do we understand? And we've looked at comprehending the truth. We've looked at realizing the truth. Now we must take a moment before we come to our time of decision about accepting the call and what it is that he is asking of us. So, this is what Jesus is asking of us. First of all, we are called to discover the truth. We are called to discover the truth. And that truth is found in the Word of God. And we just need to understand that. So we need to be discovering, the, we need to be searching after the truth, and we need to be searching into the truth as we understand and discover the Word of God. This is what he's talking about in the scholars and teachers of the Scripture. We need to understand the call. We are being called to do this, not as a necessarily a vocational minister of God. We have, we have relegated that term to just that role in our church life across this world. But you all, all of us are called to be followers of Christ. And as you are following it, we have to understand what He wants from us. He wants us to discover the truth. He wants us to do the truth. Not just to discover it, but to do the truth, to live this out. To not only learn it and to understand it, but to listen to the Word of God and to live out the Word of God. One of the best ways that we can learn about this and to, to look at how we're doing the truth is to, one, have a journal and be journaling our thoughts and our conversations with God as we're reading through the Scriptures. 
to journal those down and to think through what is it that God wants from me? What is this that's unique? What is it that God's sharing with me? What, what's my attention being drawn to? We need to be journaling our thoughts and, and our prayers and what God's sharing with us and our responses back to Him. But we also need to be understanding that our daily decisions need to be based upon the Word of God. What would bring Him honor? What would bring Him glory? What has He gifted me with? How am I supposed to be utilizing that? So we need to be discovering the truth and we need to be doing the truth, but then we need to be dispensing the truth. This is where the teaching and the sharing and, and the one-on-one -on -one comes. Being a disciple of Jesus is also a call to be a discipler of other people. And it's as if we need to have two kinds of relationships. We need to have a relationship one, with one another. We need to have a relationship with somebody that's discipling us. And then we also need to be discipling somebody else. And so that it continues on. We need to be dispensing the truth of God. And so we need to be praying and asking God, who, do you have somebody that's discipling you? Let me, we need to understand, none of us are above that. I have people in my life that speak into my heart and speak into my life. Yes, I believe that there comes a time you reach a certain level of maturity in Christ, not maturity in society, but maturity in Christ, that you may become more of a disciple lure than a disciple e. But none of us are above being taught. None of us are above that. And so we need to have people in our lives that we can go to, that we can, we can entrust, and they can share with us, and they can speak the hard things to us. Now, we don't get the opportunity to speak the hard things to everybody. It takes a relationship. If you want to, if you want to empty out the future of a church, start talking the hard truths to people you don't have a relationship with, and they'll exit out the back door never to come back, and we'll wonder in 20 years why nobody's here. But get into a relationship. Know the person. Love that person. Love that person. Not as a project to, for you to fix, but as a person created in the image of God who has made a decision of faith to follow God and that you want to help them along their journey. Oftentimes, because we've gone through the potholes we'd like for them to avoid. We've made the bad choices we hope they don't make. But some of us are stubborn. And we have to investigate the bottom of the pit on our own. And so instead of us standing on the rim of the pit going, I told you so, bring a ladder, crawl down in the pit, hug them and love them through it and help them out of it. So let us dispense the truth in relationship with people. Which one of these is God wanting you to learn with Him about? Which one is He pushing you about? Is it being a disciple? Is it being a discipler? Is it knowing the truth? Is it doing the truth? Are there some, some convictions that the Spirit of God is moving in our heart or your heart right now? Saying, you know what? I haven't been letting my decisions be based upon the Word of God. And I need to confess to God about that. And I need to repent of that. That's what this next response time is for, is for you to take a moment and say, God, I have sinned in this regard that you have revealed to me today, and I want to repent of that, and I want you to, again, clothe me in your righteousness through my confession and repentance of that before you, so that I can be right with you as I exit. That is a main point of what it is that we're going to do in just a second. Maybe you're here and say, you know what? I have strayed away from God, but I want to come back, what we traditionally might call rededicating my life to the Lord. It's a valid decision, a decision that sometimes we might need to make publicly in order to have relationships and accountability and, and the opportunity to be, to be helped through that process. 
Maybe God's leading you to make a decision of faith in Him today, and we need to have a conversation about that. Maybe God's leading you to be a member of our family, and you want to make that decision. Let's have a conversation about that. Let's talk about that. But during this time of response, as we're going to stand and sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, will you let Him have His way? Do you understand?